Praise the Lord, everybody. This is Dr. Chris Hill, and welcome to the higher level. I have a word from the Lord to share with you, and wherever you are in the world, I'm trusting that this word is going to touch you, reach you, and help to transform your life. Let's get in the word together. Our sermon tonight is found in Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 9, I'm going to begin reading in verse number 17. And with the help of the Lord, I'm going to read down to verse number 25. So if you get your Bible, get your pad out, get your pen out, get your, your, your phone out, however you watch, however you receive word tonight, I want you to get ready to receive a word from God found in Mark 9 and 17. I'm going to read from the old King James Version of the Bible. If you have a newer version, it's okay. I'm usually very familiar with that text as well, but I wanted to just launch off here. It says in Mark 9 and 17, and one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought my my son uh, unto them, and I have brought my son unto thee, my son, which hath a dumb spirit. He said, I brought my son to thee, master, that hath a dumb spirit, and wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth, teareth him, and foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spoke to your disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. I want you to underline, underscore, they could not. And he answered him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I suffer with thee? Uh, how long shall I be with thee? And then he says, bring him unto me. And they brought him, the boy, unto him. And when, when the spirit saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. And he asked his father, this is what Jesus says, he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said of a child, and oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, hear this prayer, if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said unto him, him, if thou canst believe, verse 23, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. All things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway, right away, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. What an amazing prayer. <laughs> and when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more unto him. I want to underscore the, the B part of verse number 25. He says, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, I charge thee, I command thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. I want to talk to you very quickly from the thought tonight, hidden issues. Yeah, that'll do it. Hidden issues, hidden issues. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to open the scriptures. I thank you that thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And the entrance of your word bringeth light. And as we walk in the light, as you're in the light, we have fellowship with our brothers and sisters and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Now, Father, I pray that the kind of anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy would rest, rule, and abide in this studio tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. This passage of scripture, we began to open it up in our first sermon on the seven levels of leadership or discipleship. If you didn't hear that, you can go back to our YouTube channel, Dr. Chris Hill, and you can watch that. But it will, it will stand on its own, but they go great together. Hidden issues. Push somebody, say hidden issues. Touch somebody, say hidden issues. So high five yourself and say hidden issues. We're in this passage of scripture. What we're seeing here is now Jesus has come down from the Mount of Transfiguration. We don't know how long they were up there. We know on the sixth day after he prophesied that someone who were standing around him would see the kingdom of God in 
it be, they would see the Son of Man come into his rulership before they died. And so he fulfilled that with the three on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's there with, with, he's there with John and James and Peter, who are the three. We articulated all of this in the last teaching. Now, when they come down from the mountain, there's a multitude of people that have been waiting for Jesus to come down out of the mountain. One of the people that is there waiting for Jesus to come out of the mountain is a man who has brought his son. He, he, of his own testimony, his son has a dumb spirit. His son has a mute spirit. This word dumb is an old English word. It's simply, when you translate it from the Greek, it means mute, unable to speak. And the father of the boy identifies it as a dumb spirit. He has already come. He's been there. We don't know how long he's been there. We don't know the distance from which he's come. We just know that he's come and he came seeking for Jesus, but Jesus was on the mountain. Jesus was on the mountain being transfigured. Jesus was having an encounter with Moses and Elijah and James and Peter and John. And so Jesus wasn't there. Moreover, not only was Jesus not there, the three major disciples were not there either. Peter wasn't there and James wasn't there and John wasn't there. Two of our New Testament cannot, canonical writers were not there. The major disciples, Peter the disciple of faith, John the disciple of love, and, and James the greater, the disciple of hope, neither one of them were there. And, and so the B team was on the ground while the A team was on the mountain with Jesus. And so you can imagine the disappointment of, of the man bringing his son to be delivered of this demon. You can imagine how he was disappointed <laughs> at the fact that not only was Jesus not there, John wasn't there, James wasn't there, and Peter wasn't there. He's left with Nathaniel and Matthias. <laughs> he's left with Matthew. He's, he's left with, with Judas. He's left with Thomas. He's left with Indeed, the B team is left on the ground while the A team, it would be like you going to see the Lakers play and LeBron ain't there, AD's not there, Rondo is not there. I mean, it would, the disappointment, and yet he brings his son to these other disciples and, and they can't do anything <laughs> at all with the spirit either. They don't even understand why they can't cast the spirit out. He's brought his son to see Jesus and he's left not only with the disciples, not the major disciple. I'm not taking away from the rest of the nine, nothing away from the rest of the nine. Thomas was incredible in India and the different ones did incredible work after they were infilled with the Holy Spirit. But in this particular case, they had no power and they had no authority over this spirit. And so you can imagine this, the disappointment. This is not an easy child to travel with. He is vexed with the devil that will throw him into fire and throw him into water and throw him into convulsions. We don't know how far this man came to bring his child to Jesus. We know that he is indeed a child of Abraham. We know that he has belief in this grand Messiah. He has a belief in the Messiah that will come. Maybe he doesn't know if Jesus is that Messiah, but he has heard, he has known that this man has power over devils. And so he's brought his son who of his own testimony he believes his son is vexed with this dumb spirit. He's brought him to Jesus and he, the disciples could do nothing. Mm -hmm. and, and then Jesus shows up. <laughs> Push somebody and say Jesus shows up. I love it when Jesus shows up. I love it when he comes into the story, when he comes into the picture because he rewrites the narrative. His very presence changes the atmosphere 
of a story, the atmosphere of a life. Jesus comes down from the mountain. Everybody runs to salute him, and, and they bring, the man brings his son to Jesus, and he says to him, he tells him the narrative. He says, I brought my son here, and, and Judas couldn't do nothing, and, and, and Thomas couldn't do nothing, and, and Simon the Zealot couldn't do anything. These other disciples don't have the power to, to overcome this devil, but if you can do anything, glory to God. He says, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus has an answer here that's very powerful. Verse 23, he says, all things are possible to him that believeth. All things are possible to him that believeth. Everything is possible for him or her that believeth. He, 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 he stirs him. He challenges him. He says, the limitations that you've seen before are not strong enough to stand in the way of faith. I want to prophesy to somebody. I need to speak that to somebody, that the limitations that you've seen hitherto are not strong enough to stand against the God that you serve. Everything is possible. The job is possible. The business is possible. The ministry is possible. The healing is possible. The restoration is possible. The a relationship, it is possible. All things are possible for him that believeth. And then the man, he, 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 he goes and gets his father. He go, the father goes and gets the son. But, but the first thing he says is he says, Lord, I believe Help thou mine unbelief. This is interesting here because it shows the dichotomy of faith. It shows the balance of faith. This is, I believe, one of the most honest prayers in the Bible because they're, they're certainly in the New Testament, the depth and pathos of, of trying to stand in faith. We see that often in the Psalms, particularly them that are written by David. We see the innards, uh, the inner workings of trying to find the balance of faith. But in the New Testament, I don't know if there's a better testimony, if there's a better cry out of the, the heart of a person that shows the balance of faith. He says, Lord, I believe, but help <laughs> my unbelief. He still says there's a part of me that is waffling. There's a part of me that's wavering because I've been disappointed at what happened before. I had enough faith to pack this boy up and enough faith to bring this boy all the way out here. I had enough faith to bring him to the foot of this mountain. I had enough faith to bring him to your disciples, but because I was disappointed in a, in a past encounter, it has caused my faith to waver to this point. See, that's many of us is we've been disappointed by what we've been through, but I came to tell you that God is saying to you tonight, this morning, this afternoon, wherever you are in the world, he's kept, he sent me to tell you that, that if you can have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can speak to a mountain. If you can muster the, the, the particle, the kernel, the kerygma of Christian faith, that you can begin to believe again that all things are possible. It can happen for you. I know you've been disappointed, but drag yourself through the disappointment and begin to stand on this truth that God is able to do exceeding abundant above all that you could ask or think. Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. And I love this. Is, is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus saw people start running. <laughs> they, they see that Jesus is talking to somebody. They see that, that perhaps they had seen the disciples fail. And so they, they, they were running. They, 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 all right, Jesus is here. You can hear the conversation. You can hear the buzz through the crowd. Is, is he's going to deal with that boy that, that, that Judas couldn't handle. He's going to deal with that boy that Thomas couldn't handle. He's going to deal with that boy that Simon the Zealot couldn't handle, that Nathaniel couldn't handle, that Philip couldn't handle, that Andrew couldn't handle. He's going to deal with this boy. Let's see, let's see if Jesus can do something. They start running together. They start running, and, and, and they bring the boy to him. And when the boy starts coming toward Jesus, this is the thing that's so incredible, is, is, is the boy is torn. This Greek word is to tear. It is to break. It is to rend. It is to crack. He falls into the ground, and he starts foaming. And I need you to notice this is because there's always a break down before there's a breakthrough. 
Okay, Hill. <laughs> there's always a breakdown before there's a breakthrough. There's always a moment um, right before the dawn comes where it seems very dark. Very often, you're so close to your breakthrough, and then there's a breakdown. You, you think that, that, that just when you're about to see the healing, just about to see the explosion, just about to see the growth, that there will be a time where the enemy begins to attack so vociferously so violently that it will cause your faith to waver. But be of good cheer because the only reason the enemy is fighting that badly is he knows that his time is near. He knows that his time is up. He knows that Jesus is on the scene. See, he knows who Jesus is. He knows who he is. And that devil knows that if you put one devil against Jesus, that devil's going to lose. If you put 3,000 devils against Jesus, 3,000 devils are going to he tears him. He, he wrecks him. He rips him. It's a dumb spirit, and it comes in the presence of Jesus, and it, it tears him, wrecks him, rips him. And then Jesus rebukes the devil. Oh, man, I'm getting ahead of myself. I need you to see this. Is that for first thing, it's, it's a dumb spirit. Amen. It's, it's a mute spirit. The second thing is that when it comes into the presence of Jesus, it tries to, to tear him, to, to wreck him, to break him. Then Jesus is, all this is going on. This boy is falling on the floor. He, he's foaming at the mouth. He, it's a show. Everybody is watching. And you know what Jesus does? He turns to the man and he says, so how long has he been like this? <laughs> I can see him with his spiritual uh, clipboard come out. And, and just, so how long has he been like this? How long has he been? Do you see how calm and how cool Jesus is? The devil is acting crazy. The whole situation looks nuts. And yet Jesus is as calm as a cucumber. He's standing there and he says, how long has he been like this? He's a doctor in his office. He's just kidding all of the information straight. The man says he's been like this from a child. See, I grew up in the old church. In the old church, when a, a someone who was demonized, I know y'all don't see this in your church anymore, but we had power in, the, in a powerful environment. You will begin to see that the demonic try and reach out. You'll begin to see the demonic try and act through because they can't stand the presence of God. It brings them out. Amen. When the power of God, be, I believe we're going back to a church where we'll see deliverance. I believe we're going back to a church where we'll see the power of God. I believe we're going back to a church where there will be some strange occurrences, but you have to learn how to be cool under pressure. You got to learn how to not lose your mind when things start going crazy. See, in our modern churches, you know, something start jumping off like that. Suddenly, somebody got to call security. They got to get the ushers out to ush. They got to get them ladies with them cloths to come running so they can throw things on the hinter parts of people. Uh, but look at Jesus. The devil's just acting out, and Jesus just, she's just getting the information. He's just gathering information. How long has he been like this? He's calm, and he's cool because you don't have to trip when you know you have power. You don't have to lose it when you know you have authority. You don't have to get all caught up in the hype of that moment because the enemy is just trying to distract you from the fact that he's in, he's, he's about to be cast out. He's trying to, trying to pull down your faith level by acting out in that place. But Jesus knows who he is and knows what he can do. And he speaks a word and he my God today. Can I, can I go backwards here? He, he asked the man, how long has he been like this? He says, been like this from a child. And then he says, and, and often this spirit has cast him into fire and cast him into water so as to destroy him, so as to kill him, as to kill him. This spirit has been trying to kill this boy since he was a child, has been trying to kill this boy since he was a child, okay? So let's run it all back. So it's a dumb spirit. That, that, that tries to break him, tear him, wreck him, and kill him. Okay, so let, let's work on take break break this word this word in the th this word tear it means to break it means to crush it means to destroy see this enemy he's trying to 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 make you mute mm hmm he's trying to wreck you uh-huh and and then he's trying to kill you. 
I want you to understand why the enemy wants you to be silent. He wants the church to be silent. He wants the believers to be silent because life and death is in the power of your tongue and you will have whatever you say you have. He doesn't want you speaking faith and speaking blessing and speaking healing and speaking advancement and speaking promotion. He's afraid of your mouth. This devil is dispatched from hell just to shut this boy's mouth. But I declare unto you that if you begin to speak life, you'll see life. Uh, life and death is in the power of your tongue. It's not about what's happening to you. It's what you say about what's happening to you. You have to learn how to speak healing. I'm blessed. I'm delivered. I'm healed. I'm clear. I'm over it. I'm out of it. I'm on. T oh, y'all better come get me because I feel like preaching today. Guys, I want you to see this is that is that life and death is in your mouth. And if you don't speak it, you won't have it. Here it is, is you have to speak life. The second thing the enemy is trying to do is wreck you. He's trying to destroy you. He's trying to crack you under the pressure of everyday life. He's trying to crack you and bring you down and destroy you and wreck your destination. And then thirdly, here it is, He's trying to kill you. I wish I could see a show of hands. I wish you would write it on the screen. I wish you would put it in the comments of how many of you have had the enemy try to kill you in the car wreck, kill you in a drowning, kill you in an overdose, kill you in an accident, kill you on an airplane, kill you in tra I mean literally, absolutely kill you because John, oh my God. John 10, 10, the thief comes, but to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus has come that we might have life and have it more abundantly. I want you to see this is steal, uh huh, kill, and destroy. Let, okay, I'm going to change the order a little bit. Steal, how does he steal from you? If you don't speak it, you won't have it. If the enemy can get you to be silent, he can cause you to live in the box of limitation. But when you begin to speak out and declare what you're looking for God to do, then you begin to reap the benefit of what you speak out. Life and death is in the power of your tongue and you'll have whatever you say. If you don't say it, it will be stolen because the enemy comes to steal. Secondly, he comes to kill. That's the third one. He's been trying to kill this boy from a child. Thank God. God preserved his life. Someone ought to thank God that he preserved your life. The only reason you're still here is he preserved, he kept, he protected your life. The enemy can't kill what God has blessed. If there's a call on your life, if there's a destiny on your life, and I came to tell you there is, God is calling you, and so he'll keep you until you can walk into that calling. He tries to kill you, and but this one's the most insidious, is he tries to destroy you. He tries he tries to crack you. He tries to break you. He tries to wreck you. Someone else had gone through what you've been through had, would have already lost their mind, but God has held your mind together. God has held your soul together. God has held your life from wrecking, kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus says that he has come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. I want to pray today that you begin to walk in that abundant life. I call that the higher level. I, I, I'm praying today that you begin to walk in the fullness of what God has for you. I call that the higher level. I'm praying today that you dream on a higher level, live on a higher level, plan on a higher level, walk on a higher level, talk on a higher level, and you begin to reach, preach, and reflect the glory of God in the world because people are looking for people to follow who are are walking on the path of higher. Let's go higher. Let's go higher. Let's go higher. We have to stop the attack of the enemy on God's people, and we can do that. Let's speak different. Mm -hmm. Let's speak different. Let's begin to speak a whole new narrative over our own lives. Let, 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 let's begin to declare in our own lives that we're not going to break 
My family's not going to break. My business's not going to break. My mind's not going to break. My heart's not going to break. I will not be torn asunder by the enemy. And then finally, I cancel the attack of the enemy. I cancel, in the name of Jesus, I cancel the demonic attack of the enemy that has tried to destroy and kill your life. I, that enemy's been trying to kill you since you were a little child and yet and still the hand of the Lord has stopped him every single time and you're still here and I turn in Jesus name the death the death attack against you in Jesus name and I speak life over you in the mighty name of Jesus hidden issues I wanted you to see this all this to get here in verse number 25 See, is, is he says uh, uh, a death, is the daddy said it was a dumb spirit, but Jesus does something that blew my mind. He calls it, he says, come out of him, you deaf and dumb spirit. I need you to see this, deaf and dumb spirit. The daddy said it was a dumb spirit. He misidentified it because there were some hidden issues that only Jesus could discern. Very often, we think we're fighting this, but we need the discernment that comes from God to find out what we're really fighting. The dad thought he was fighting a dumb spirit. He was fighting a deaf and dumb spirit. It wasn't just one issue. We need to, in this season of our lives, allow the Holy Spirit to direct us into the real issues of our lives because that's where we need deliverance. That's where we need healing. That's where we need restoration. And when we let Jesus deal with the hidden issues, we will come into the fullness of God. Let's pray together. Father, I'm praying for discernment to reign on your people tonight. I'm praying that we would come into a new level of discernment, that we would begin to do some self-evaluation. We begin to allow the Holy Spirit to walk through the corridors of our lives and to go through the cupboards of our, of our own hurts, the things that we have suppressed, the things we have pushed down, all the things we've gone through. Father, we want deliverance not just on the things that people see. Huh? We need deliverance in the things that people can't even see. Not even our family members know what we really deal with, but God, you know, and God, you're able to heal. You're able to touch. You're able to deal with our hidden issues. I thank you today that nothing is too much for you. Nothing is out of bounds for you. Would you walk in my friend's life today? Would you walk in that pastor's life today? Walk in that leader's life today? Walk in that lady's life today? Touch my mother, touch my father, touch my brother, touch my uncle, touch my auntie. Today, would you find that hidden issue and bring deliverance and freedom to the life of your people? In Jesus' name we pray and say, amen. Good God. I feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Thank God for moving. God, you're so good. If you enjoyed this word today, I need you to do two things for me. The first thing that I want you to do is I want you to sow into the word of God. There's so much, there's such a need for this kind of preaching and teaching. And if we all do something together, we can be able to take it continuously to a higher level. There's so many different needs that we have in the ministry as we're expanding our studio. And we need chairs so we get people in here. <laughs> we, we, need, we need more lights and, and more more and it, it's all coming together quickly but I need your help to do that I need your help to do that there's not only do we want to work in our virtual church we also want to begin to do some great work right here in the Mile High City and in foreign missions and so I need your help to do that if you're touched in your heart to give if you're touched in your heart to sow there's two ways we can do that now is we have we're on the tithely app it's so awesome. And you can download that app from every way, t everywhere, tithely. <laughs> Amen. I'm so excited about it. And, and when you get that app, you just look for Higher 
level Denver, and you can give that way. Or if you're sitting there with your phone right now, and I need, we need your help. We are, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. We need your help to grow and expand and, and to do more of this. I want you to just text the word give to 844-934-0710. Brand new. 844-934-0710. Just text the word give and you're going to get a phone number right away that will walk you through ways that you can tithe and you can give and you can sow in a love gift right to this ministry. I praise God for you. I praise God for your support. I'm so thankful that you are joining us in this journey to the higher level. In Jesus' name, amen.